So we're going to walk through some examples of uh, building and running GPU applications on Perlmutter. So this slide is uh, slightly out of date now with the time. We'll shift the times back slightly and try to catch up during, during the next sort of few sessions. Uh, so in this session, we'll walk through building and running an application on Perlmutter with MPI and GPUs using CUDA as an example. Uh, we'll then have a little bit of a break, um, which should have around about hit at lunchtime for those on the, the Eastern time zone in the US. Uh, and then we'll go into session two, which will be a, a slightly longer, also hands-on oriented session, where we'll walk through a few kind of additional scenarios, uh, such as a little bit about some of the math libraries uh, using other compilers rather than only NVIDIA, uh, looking at CUDA aware MPI, looking at things that are not CUDA, uh, and a few tips about using uh, CMake and or SPAC when you're building. So a goal for this first session is basically to build and run a simple application using MPI to communicate between tasks and CUDA to offload computation to GPUs within a task. So here's a kind of a cartoon of a, a block diagram of what a couple of nodes of Perlmutter looks like. We have our AMD uh, Zen 3 CPU connected to four NVIDIA Ampere GPUs, a bunch of uh, RAM on the CPU, a bunch of RAM within the GPUs. We use CUDA to move data and kernels between the CPU and the GPUs, and we use MPI to pass data around between the nodes. So first up, when you are compiling code, so you'll have your normal you know, program source codes, so a bunch of VOC, C++, Fortran 90, CPU source code files. These can have MPI calls within them. They may use directives for using GPUs, such as uh, OpenACC or OpenMP. Uh, those you'll compile with the regular compilers and, and more specifically generally on Perlmutter and you know, NERSC Cray systems, you'll be using the Cray wrappers which give you the, the MPI stack and uh, some other kind of niceties built in. So these compilers are capital CC is the C++ compiler, lowercase CC is the C compiler, and FTN is the Fortran compiler. This is all uh, things that uh, your NERSC users have been using Cori already for a while will be familiar with. Uh, then we have CUDA code, which comes in uh, .cu files, and those ones will compile with NVCC, which is part of the NVIDIA CUDA stack. Um, just a kind of a, a note and tip there, with program of NVIDIA, which uses the NVIDIA uh, CPU side compilers, uh, those can actually read CUDA code incorporated into the same source files. Uh, to sort of enable that, you can add the dash CUDA or dash GPU flag at compile time, and we'll actually see that in a couple of the examples. So looking at the software stacks that we'll be working with, on the left-hand side here, we have uh, by default, we have the program NVIDIA software stack loaded. This gives you the NVIDIA compilers uh, plus the Cray compiler wrappers, uh, a few kind of useful underlying Cray libraries such as, uh, such as uh, Cray libsci and the MPI stack. Um, we uh, recommend generally, if possible, use the provided Cray MPitch rather than building your own open MPI or whatever, because uh, that's the one that's sort of best optimized for our, our high-speed network. Uh, and also in this is the Cray P magic that makes the compiler wrappers kind of you know, do a lot of things automatically without you needing to put uh, extraneous options in there. So this should be fairly familiar if you've already used Cori. What's new on Perlmutter, but might be familiar if you've used uh, GPU and uh, CUDA applications on other systems is the CUDA stack here, which you can get with a module load CUDA toolkit. And that gets you NVCC, the uh, NVIDIA CUDA compiler we talked about before, uh, plus a bunch of libraries and tools, which is all part of the NVIDIA to, uh, CUDA toolkit that are needed for GPU code. So, so you'll need to module load CUDA toolkit when you're building things for GPUs.
So what to actually load for most applications, including the examples today, we recommend that you use the program video stack. And this one is loaded by default when you log into Palmata. So unless you're changing something that should already be there. To build GPU applications, which is going to be the case for phase one, uh, you'll also need to load a CUDA toolkit module. There are a whole slew of CUDA toolkit modules available on the system uh, that match with different versions of CUDA and different versions of the um, compiler, particularly the NVIDIA compiler. The default one is generally the best one to use you know, off the bat, unless it doesn't work, uh, pretty much what you want to do is choose one that has a CUDA version that matches what your application needs. And the default one is currently the, the latest available CUDA version on Perlmutter. So 11.4, I think. Uh, if you're doing OpenMP or OpenACC offloading or also using uh, CUDA aware MPI, which we're covering a little bit, you'll also need to load one of the uh, CREPE Excel modules and in particular we want nvidia 80 you'll see this number 80 pop up a bit this is because the uh if you like i guess architecture indicator architecture version number of our gpus is is sm80 so that's that 80 is the ampere series uh if you used Cori gpu you will have seen uh, sm70 come up a bit that was the volta that we had before All right, so let's get kind of straight into it. Um, hopefully people have got a session open that they can uh, log into Perlmutter on. From there, git clone uh, this unfortunately rather long URL. But what you can do is if you type module show training, uh, it will print up a little help text that includes this URL, so you can copy and paste it. Uh, within there, go to the uh, the directory called CUDA slash ex3, we'll jump straight to example three. Um, don't forget to module load CUDA toolkit, run make and take a look at the output. So, how can I see, oops. Here we go. So what we'll do to uh, try to basically identify when people are ready to move on, if everybody can use your Zoom session to raise your hand um, to begin with, and then when you've made it through the exercise, uh, lower your hand and we'll kind of watch for hands that are raised and, and hands that are lowered to see kind of yeah, where people are up to. Um, I will also create a breakout room. Let's see. I'll be helping. And we'll call it help. Up, uh, if you have issues, uh, having account issues, as well as the core model issues. Okay, so hopefully you should see now in your Zoom controls an option to jump to a breakout room. And there's a breakout room called uh, help with uh, connections, I think is what I called it. Um, and we'll have uh, one or two nurse people in there. So if you're having trouble, not so much with the exercise, not perhaps with the exercise, but, but particularly with just getting onto Perlmutter if there's something wrong with your account, uh, please use the breakout room and then we can uh, sort of yeah, separate those challenges from uh, challenges of using the exercise itself. Uh, don't forget that we have the Google Doc, which is a good place to ask questions as well. So I can see, I can see quite a few hands raised, which is a good sign. People are pay paying attention and raising hands, and and some may have already finished. It's going up and down. Uh, we might make it uh, sort of about five minutes instead of 10 minutes to run through this. It should be a, a reasonably simple exercise, hopefully.
I see a question in the chat from uh, from William about uh, should we clone it to Hove or Pscratch? You can clone it to either really actually. Um, it's a, a, a reasonably small set of examples. So for issues with compilation, uh, if it's a if it's a straightforward question, I think the Google Doc is going to be the way to go. So we have a, a few nurse people watching the Google Doc. Unfortunately, with screen sharing, I can't see it at the moment. So uh, hopefully, uh, somebody from nurse will slack me if there's a any questions that I should answer. Uh, that's a good tip from Daniel. If you're having trouble logging in directly, um, Try logging into Cori first. That can simplify some of the networking complexities. For the chat. Uh, zoom controls all over my screen. Okay, so what just happened? You should have seen something like the command you see here appear on your screen. What does this tell us? All right, so up here we've got uh, CC. Uh, the make file is calling on the C++ Cray compiler wrapper. It's all a single CUDA file in this example. Um, the Cray wrapper is calling the NVIDIA C++ compiler underneath, and that accepts an option dash GPU equals, and CC80 is the tag for the architecture that corresponds with our um, GPUs. And it's creating an executable called uh, vec underscore add. If uh, you did have troubles with that, there is a, a ready-made executable actually that uh, is in the examples directory that's pointed out by that module show training. So um, you may have already uh, poked around and discovered these. There's a few more exercises in that same directory to walk through kind of at, at your leisure. We, we looked at uh, exercise three, which is MPI plus GPU. Exercise one and exercise two, um, uh, simple GPU kernel only without MPI, um, you know, particularly if you found difficulties uh, building the MPI one, uh, these might be a, a good place to start to you know, solve, uh, solve problems one at a time. And the README one level up should have a bunch of uh, information. Although we might have to check that. Somebody did comment that uh, a README.md file they found was empty. Okay. Next step then is once we build it is to run it. Important things to remember. Uh, this is a, a HPC cluster. Don't run on the login nodes, submit a batch job. So in this case, it's a very short job. So, uh, so, so it might not be as critical, but for any real work, you definitely wanna be submitting a batch job. Also when you're in the uh, batch environment, you know, you've got the full you know, slingshot MPI stack, um, you know, I think on, on Perlmutter, this is going to be a little bit easier than it uh, was on Cori. Um, uh, you also do have, as Chris noted, um, uh, GPUs available on the login nodes, which can be helpful for when you're building things for you know, when dot slash configure wants to run little tests. Uh, other important thing to remember is when you're submitting a job on Perlmutter, you must specify a GPU enabled account name. Um, this will look like your regular repo, but we'll have a underscore G suffix. So for today, everybody's in the intrain three repo and the intrain three underscore G repo. So when you uh, submit a job, 
you'll need to uh, dispatch dash A and get that account. When you're doing you know, your, your kind of real work later, you'll use your own project um, account for that. So there's a bunch of necessary S, uh, S batch options and having GPUs, there are a couple more now than what you were familiar with on Cori. The first bunch are the same pretty much. Um, so you'll need a Q, which is a QoS, and for almost everything, you'll want to use the regular QoS. Uh, you want to set a time limit uh, if you give it just a number, that's the time limit in minutes for Slurm. So in this example here, where we're saying that after five minutes, Slurm is allowed to kill this job. For a, for a real job, you'll probably want a few hours. Finding the, the right time limit is very application dependent and uh, it is worth experimenting with to get the right number. Dash lowercase n specifies a number of MPI tasks. Um, Notice this is a lowercase, so this is the number of MPI tasks as opposed to an uppercase, which would be the number of nodes. And we'll uh, come back around to that on the next slide when we're talking about uh, uh, splitting work over GPUs as well as nodes. Uh, dash C sets the number of CPUs per task. Slurm considers a CPU to be what Linux considers a CPU, which is actually what we might call a, a hyperthread. So our AMD GPU nodes each have 64 cores, each core has two hyperthreads. So, uh, so Linux and therefore Slurm sees the node as having 128 CPUs. So here, uh, dash C32 means that for a single MPI task, you're reserving one quarter of a node. Uh, we'll get to the next few in the next slide, but importantly, particularly for today, is we have a reservation uh, called Perlmutter Day One. And you know, I think that actually should be two dashes in reservation, uh, but it should be right in the batch file, I hope. Um, so when you submit, it will go to this Perlmutter day one reservation, which you should have access to because of the entering three um, underscore G repo that, you're, that everybody is in. Um, for normal work afterwards, you won't be using a reservation. So you'll need to comment that out. And new things are the GPU oriented options that you'll need to set. In this case, so we specified here that we wanted eight MPI tasks. We also want to specify how many tasks per node. And so our GPU nodes have got four GPUs per node. And so kind of the, I guess the simplest way to use things is to have one MPI task per GPU which is to say four MPI tasks per node. So this sort of corresponds with this dash C32, which gave us a quarter of a node for each task. GPUs per task is one. We wanna specify the entrain three account and we want to reserve a GPU node. So it looks like there is quite a few uh, comments and questions in the chat. And it looks like uh, Ronnie and Laurie uh, hoping answer them very quickly. So thanks for that. All right, then we come to actually running the GPU code. So uh, skip out the top part of the, um, the batch script up here. And it finishes up with pretty much S run and an S run command. So this is, uh, should be fairly familiar uh, for those who have used Cori before. Uh, just another thing that you'll see when we look at the examples in a moment is several of the examples don't have GPUs per task, but instead they have dash capital G. So with dash capital G, you're specifying the total amount of GPUs for the job. So if you've got two nodes, that's eight GPUs available, you know, dash capital G eight. This is kind of a handy shorthand. It's shorter to type than GPUs per task uh, and good for when you're just using one or two nodes. When you start using larger numbers of nodes, um, you know, calculating it out will get a little bit unwieldy and you know, it's a little harder for documentation in, in terms of you know, you've got to calculate it out to work out for nodes. So for, for you know, larger scale real jobs, you probably want to switch across to GPUs per task. But that's what the dash G means in the examples here. 
Next thing, of course, uh, we'll, we'll try it out in just a minute, but just a, a heads up, what if it doesn't work? If you see errors, one thing to check is that you do have all of the sbatch directives specified. Uh, so an easy, easy thing to omit is if you don't set GPUs per task. Uh, then what you can get is actually a floating point error. And the re uh, it's a floating point error and not a sequel. Uh, and the reason for this is that basically the, the GPU hasn't been allocated to the job you're trying to run on a GPU. It doesn't have one that, that trips over. So if you get an error, first thing to check is that you have all of the SBATCH uh, directives set. All right, so now let's go to another uh, hands-on period. Um, in your clone of that directory, you can go back to ex3, uh, make, if you haven't already done that, which you uh, hopefully should have. If you didn't succeed in building it before, the uh, module show training or module load training will uh, point you at a place where we actually have a pre-built executable that you can use, you can copy across. Uh, then sbatch the batch script there, take a look at it first. and. Uh, once you've had success with that, and if you would uh, like to go further, yeah, try tinkering around with it, see if you can make it run across two nodes. Uh, we'll do the same thing if everybody can raise a hand in Zoom and then lower it once you have succeeded. The breakout room should still be open. So if you're still having connection issues, uh, jump across to the breakout room for help. And so we've partly caught up now. It's now 9.25. Actually, we've more than caught up. Um, so we'll have about sort of five or 10 minutes for this. And I think what comes after this is actually a break. So we can continue. So we'll move along to the next step. We actually have two, uh, we, we do have one more uh, topic and exercise in this session before moving on to the second session. So we so we are still slightly behind, but uh, not too far. And we should catch up in the next one. So the other thing to talk about is affinity. So let me some of these zoom windows away a bit. So Experienced Cori users will be familiar already with the ideas of affinity and binding. We use those on that system as well. So different CPU cores have an affinity, which is to say a, a closeness to certain memory and caches. And you can bind a thread or a process to particular cores to make sure that that thread stays, uh, stays on a core that's close to its data, um, you know, whether that data be in memory or in the local cache. And there are some environment variables and SRUN settings that you can use to control this, such as OpenMP places, OMP places, uh, and uh, the dash dash CPU bind option for SRUN. So a similar concept holds for Perlmutter as well. So the Perlmutter GPU nodes are configured in what's called NPS4. It stands for NUMA nodes per socket four, uh, which basically means that each uh, each socket, each uh, CPU or what would you call it, node, I guess, is arranged so that um, certain cores are closer to certain uh, GPUs. There are, there are four kind of NUMA nodes on each GPU node and each GPU is closest to one of them. So this diagram here kind of in a, in a slightly cartoonish way illustrates that the CCD is sort of the the unit that holds a bunch of cores in AMD's um, Epic architecture. It's divided here into four quadrants. There is a certain amount of memory that's closest to each quadrant and a single GPU that's closest to each quadrant. So where this starts to matter is when you are arranging your job, you know, you've got uh, some GPU tasks, some of the work can happen on CPUs that's spread over multiple nodes. So you're gonna to wanna to have uh, some sort of control over this. There's actually quite a lot or several options that you can use around binding. And the ones here are sort of a, a good place to start with, sort of a, a, a reasonably sensible default. 
So you can set the GPU binding in your srun command with uh, these options. So here we've got srun n8, so we're running eight tasks. Uh, dash dash CPU bind equals cores, which is to say that a given task uh, is locked to certain cores. It can move around in the hyperthreads on those cores, but it has you know the this subset of cores available to it that have uh, you know the, the the same cache as they used on the last time slice. And the GPU bind is set here to closest, which is to say so that the task you're running in this previous picture here, it's running on certain cores. And when it offloads to the GPU, it will offload to a GPU that is closest to that core. Uh, so here, I think we have a, a bit of an implicit assumption here of uh, two nodes since we're using eight MPI tasks. This link here, um, docs.nest.gov jobs affinity has uh, more information about the GPU binding options. And we can do a quick hands-on to try it out in EX5 of that uh, same repo that you've been working in. I think these batch scripts have actually been renamed uh, since I wrote these slides. So uh, it might now be called batch reg and batch close. So if you go in here, uh, make the code, it's the same executable, but these two batch scripts will uh, do different things with the binding. So one won't do anything with the binding and the other will bind it to the closest GPU. And if you look at the outputs of each, uh, it uh, describes in terms of um, PCI identifiers, which GPU each task has uh, available to it. Uh, so what we were going to do here was uh, finish with this exercise before the break, but we've already had the break. So instead we'll just spend about five minutes doing this and then reconvene. Um, so let's do the same thing just to be able to see where people are at, if everybody can raise their hand on Zoom and uh, when you've been able to run the exercise and yeah, seen some interesting output from it, put your hand down and when the number of raised hands gets reasonably small or after a few minutes, we'll continue. And run a so now that we're recording again, to recap what we've talked about so far this morning, we've built and run a simple C++ application using MPI with CUDA, um, using Cray compiler wrappers for the CPU MPI side code and NVCC for the CUDA code. Uh, we have an, uh, you know, looked at and are using two software stacks. So we're using the program NVIDIA software stack for the CPU and MPI kind of aspects of the code, parts of the code and CUDA toolkit for the GPU and uh, your know, .cu files. Uh, we looked at which SBATCH directives need to be set to run on the GPU nodes. And we experimented just a little bit with GPU affinity. So for the, for the rest of this session, we're going to go into uh, a few of the more of the edge cases for a lot of people you might be saying, yeah, this is, this is all very well for a, a simple training exercise, but my application is more complicated than that. So we'll go through a, a few other common scenarios that uh, people are likely to hit and what you can do in those cases. So some topics for, for here are, uh, what about things like BLAS, LARP, FFTW, et cetera, when you're using GPUs? What about if the NVIDIA compiler isn't, isn't suitable for or doesn't work for your application? What's CUDA aware MPI? When do you need to use it? And how do you use it? What if the ap application you're trying to build and use doesn't use CUDA directly? It uses something like OpenMP or OpenACC. Uh, and then a, a couple of tips on building code when you're using CMake or SPAC. Uh, so GPU accelerated math libraries in CUDA. So there are GPU accelerated implementations of or alternatives to a lot of the common math libraries. So, so for instance, uh, BLAS, which is sort of at the bottom of everything, there's a uh, KUBLAS, which is a CUDA equivalent, and you get that when you're module load toolkit. LARPAC doesn't have a direct equivalent, 
um, in the NVIDIA stack, but uh, the NVIDIA stack does include QSolver, which uh, does similar things to a lot of the LARPEC routines uh, and includes uh, some of the LARPEC routines directly. Uh, it doesn't have quite the same API though. So you, uh, you do need to you know, write your code for it. But the good news is with the NVIDIA compiler, there's an option you can add, which is uh, dash NVLA math. And uh, what that does, it, it basically adds a, uh, a LAPEC equivalent, um, or a LAPEC and plus equivalent uh, interface to the CU um, libraries. Uh, haven't included a link here, but if you do a search for dash NVLA math on our docs, you should find something. Uh, FFTW, there's a CUFFT, which is a you know, CUDA oriented FFT, and CUFFTW, which is an FFTW interface to that. Uh, there's also CU Sparse, which does uh, yeah, some sparse solvers. So those, those ones are part of the NVIDIA stack that you get with module load CUDA toolkit. There are also a bunch of third party math libraries that are GPU accelerated, um, two that are probably particularly uh, useful and important, uh, Magma and Slate, which between them cover plus a subset of LAPAC and scalar pack. And uh, look, here's the link that you'll uh, want to follow in our docs to some tips about using these libraries. So we're not going to go into too much detail about those today, but just a, a reminder and a, a quick plug for an upcoming training that Helen mentioned in the welcome this morning. Uh, this is only next week, I think. Um, we have some training from NVIDIA about their HPC SDK. Uh, it's a hands-on training. It will cover, amongst other things, these uh, accelerate, GPU accelerated math libraries. There's a link down here for registration and info. These slides, uh, if you want to, quicker than typing it in, these slides are available from this training events um, web page at the moment. So you can download those slides and click on that link. Next scenario is what if you're not using the NVIDIA compiler? So, so we recommend the NVIDIA compiler for you know, as, the, as the first um, approach for most things for GPU-based applications on Perlmutter. It's, you know, it's the one that has the best support for the GPU you know, tool chain. Um, it's the one that we've sort of you know, done the most with in terms of, um, you know, NERSC zone preparation on, on Perlmutter. Uh, it's the default and it's the one that's, you know, loaded by default when you log in. So, you know, that, that's kind of all for a reason. So, you know, do try that first. Uh, however, you know, we have, uh, we have four different compiler stacks and they all have different strengths and weaknesses. And yeah, you might find that for some applications, uh, you do hit uh, difficulties with program NVIDIA. It's very well focused on GPUs, but yeah, it might, uh, you might find it, it trips up on certain CPU-based cases. Uh, so our second recommendation, our second recommendation for a uh, program is program GNU, which is uh, yeah, kind of you know, quite widely supported. It's pretty portable, it's available in everything. Uh, which tends to mean that it uh, you know, gets uh, bug fixes and features and so on fairly quickly. So that's what we recommend as a second alternative. Uh, we also have on the system, if you uh, type um, module avail program, you'll see we have a, there's a Cray program, uh, programming environment and an AMD programming environment. These two currently are more CPU oriented than GPU oriented and um, we haven't done too much with them just yet. Okay, so oops. a couple of uh, limitations to be aware of for different um, compiler stacks. When you're using the GNU compiler, uh, you need to choose the right GCC version for the CUDA version that you're using. Uh, the good news is that doing the default uh, should just work. 
So the, the default CUDA toolkit is actually CUDA toolkit 21.9 underscore 11.4, and that supports the default GCC, which is 11.2.0. But if you're using an earlier toolkit version, you'll also need to use an earlier GCC version. Uh, the GNU compilers that we have installed don't currently support OpenMP and OpenACC offloading. Uh, that is coming soon, I think, but it's not there yet. Um, also, the handy trick of having CUDA code um, embedded in your source files is specific to the NVIDIA compiler. So with the GNU compiler, you need to have the CUDA code in its own separate .cu file. There's another compiler stack that I didn't mention before, which is the LLVM one. Um, LLVM is yeah, the clang and flang stack. Um, a few of the other compiler stacks are actually based on it. And coming soon, we, we have uh, plans and development of a program of LLVM as a, a NERSC supported program based on the LLVM compiler. Uh, it's not there yet. It's not far off, I understand. Um, it's currently targeting C and C++ only. Uh, it doesn't have a, a Fortran stack in there yet. Uh, it should have support for SQL and OpenMP offload. And uh, as I said, it's not available just yet, but is expected soon. Uh, we have the Cray compiler. The limitation we currently have with the Cray compiler is that it, uh, it supports the uh, V100 GPUs, which is the model before ours, but it doesn't yet support the A100 GPUs. Um, so to use that, you, the A100 GPUs could still run V100 code, but it's not going to be as, as optimized, and you need to load a, a different CREPE Excel module for that. There's the one earlier. Uh, also, we really haven't spent much um, time testing this, and so you know, NERSC's ability to support it is a little bit more limited. And AOCC kind of has a, a similar issue there um, in that uh, NERSC hasn't spent any real time testing and uh, you know building up expertise here. So our ability to support it is still fairly limited. That will probably be you know, more of a focus come phase two when we have CPU oriented nodes. Uh, also currently the AOCC compiler doesn't have the offloading support yet. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really targeting phase two rather than phase one. So in summary, our recommendation is that uh, use program NVIDIA as the first option. And if that's not viable, use program GNU. Uh, support for the other tool chains will improve, but uh, so far our, our support is kind of limited to these two. Some errors that you might see when uh, using different programs. Oh, here we go. This is this is actually in, in reference to the next example. Um, so we're going to do a hands-on exercise in a moment. And just a heads up of some of the errors that you might see and things that you might need to tweak while you're attempting this. If you see something about floating point exception, uh, we mentioned this before, check that you've actually requested GPUs. Um, errors about bind requests not specify or was it does not specify any of the devices within the allocation if it complains about binding check if you actually requested all of the gpus in a node if you, if you only requested half of the gpus uh, and it tries to bind to the closest it might bind it might be attempting to bind to one that isn't actually you know marked in slam as allocated to you and if you hit a cannot open shared object file this can happen if you've built part of the code with one program and another part of the code with a different program. Um, you know, they're trying to access sort of different versions of similar libraries. This can kind of get messy. So it's a good idea to do a, a make clean and you know, make sure that the object files are successfully deleted between, uh, after you swap programs. So for our next hands-on exercise, let's... Uh, Try it out back on Perlmutter. We'll use uh, exercise four and exercise five again. See if you can build them with program GNU. You might need to make it a few changes to, um, you know, make files and batch files. 
Um, just to note that this is viable with exercise four and exercise five. Exercise three, if you try to build with program GNU, you'll get some sort of you know, curious looking errors. And it's because that in exercise three, we've got the CUDA and the C++ code all merged into the same source file. And that uh, feature is only supported by program NVIDIA. So you won't, uh, won't be able to build that with program GNU, but it can be interesting to yeah, have a try and look at what the error messages are and you know, recognize them for uh, when it comes to working with your own code. So let's spend uh, 10 minutes on this, have a crack at building these uh, uh, exercise four and exercise five with program GNU, and we'll do the same thing. If everybody can raise a hand and lower it when they're done, and that should to give us a, a bit of an idea of uh, how, how many of us have finished the exercise. And we'll reconvene in yeah, five or 10 minutes. Hands on exercise. So we'll continue. If you are still uh, stuck on anything, please post a question in the Google Doc or uh, jump into the breakout room. So next, let's uh, remove some of these windows. Okay, CUDA aware MPI. So what does this actually mean? So NVIDIA has a, a feature called the UVA, which I think stands for Unified Virtual Address. Um, what it does is it prevents the GPU device memory as part of the same address space as the CPU main memory. So this, uh, this is a diagram that comes from NVIDIA's website, um, kind of illustrating what this means. So, so the CPU has a certain amount of RAM attached to it and each GPU has a certain amount of RAM inside it as well. And kind of, you know, naively pre-UVA, uh, each of these is separate. It's a separate address space. They can't really talk to each other. Having a single address space is more like this picture over here on the right, where the memory might be in physically different places, but it's arranged as a, you know, logically um, you know, contiguous block of addresses. And what this means is that a CUDA aware MPI implementation and Cray and Pictures is one of these can send and receive messages directly from the GPU memory of one node to the GPU memory on you know, a GPU on a different node, uh, as opposed to you know, if it's separate address spaces, then what you would need to do is actually use a, uh, a CUDA mem or is it CUDA, CUDA host to device, CUDA device to, to host mem copy to move the memory from the GPU into main memory, send it through MPI that way, and then move it from main memory on the other end back into the GPU. So obviously having a CUDA aware MPI here to be able to transfer memory directly from GPU to GPU can save a lot of buffer copying, particularly when 
most of the work that your application is doing is happening on the GPU. So how do you know if you're using it? Uh, one good tip is to use the LDD command to have a look at the executable. This for a dynamic executable, which is now the default on um, Kalmata for building, um, it shows what libraries the executable wants to use and where it's finding those libraries. And you know, this can help to debug things like, you know, I'm missing something from LD library path. Uh, another thing it can help is in showing which libraries you are using. And so if you run LDD on your executable and you see one of the libraries in here is called libmpi gtl CUDA, that means that you have uh, CUDA aware MPI available to you. So GTL stands for something like GNU transport layer, I think. And this is this is Cray's library for providing um, GPU to GPU memory transfers, uh, uh, what do you call it? No, network, network transfers from node to node. To actually make use of this CUDA aware MPI, you do need to enable it at runtime. And you can do this with an environment variable, which is uh, mpitch underscore GPU support underscore enabled equals one. You have, uh... so let's uh, give it a try. Jump back onto into your Perlmutter window. And you might need to go back a directory to see it, but there should be a directory called CUDA aware MPI. Uh, take a little bit of a look at this. This is a, a different application. It's again, it's a, just a very simple uh, MPI broadcast. Uh, has some memory, uh, sorry, has a, uh, a buffer in GPU memory and it will directly transfer it from one GPU to another GPU. We don't need to worry too much about the source code at this point. I, I think the yeah, the focus here is really on how you build and use it, but it might be interesting to look at the source code just to kind of yeah, see what it is that it's doing. But most importantly, build and run it and run LDD on it and see if you can see that libmpi GCL CUDA. Uh, a couple of tips. Don't forget you need to switch back to program NVIDIA. Uh, also, make sure that you have the two uh, CUDA toolkit library loaded and you will also need the um, Crepe Excel NVIDIA 80 module loaded for this one to get access to the uh, CUDA aware MPI. So that's been about five minutes on that. We'll do the same thing, raise a hand and uh, lower it when you're done and when we have kind of a quorum, we'll continue. I've missed a step here. Hopefully, uh, if I remember rightly, I think in that um, exercise, there was also a batch script that you can run. Um, and in fact, this output will probably be in that um, in the output from that batch script. Uh, the batch script has the setting of the environment variable as well. Um, if you want to experiment, you can try unsetting the environment variable. And what you should see is uh, some sort of a, probably a seg fault. A couple of other scenarios that uh, you may be working with. Maybe you're not using CUDA. So there are a couple of offload options. There's uh, OpenMP and OpenACC. And so different applications that you're using uh, may use one of these. Inside the application, if it's OpenMP, it will look something like this. You, you'll have directives, you have Pragma, OMP, target teams, blah, 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 with some map directives in there. Uh, open AP, uh, OpenACC is a little bit similar. You'll have directives in the code that say things like uh, Pragma ACC parallel loop. Uh, OpenACC in a way is a slightly kind of a, a higher level, a higher level of abstraction. So if your application uses OpenMP, what you'll need to add at compile time is these C or C++ flags dash MP for multiprocessing equals GPU, dash GPU equals CC80. This is that magic 80 number again, because we're using um, 
NVIDIA Ampere. And this last one, dash M info is optional, but quite useful. It prints a bunch of information during compile about what the compiler is doing with the OpenMP directives and uh, OpenMP offloaded um, kernels and loops. Similarly, when you're building OpenACC codes, you'll add uh, a couple of options to your C or C++ flags, uh, dash ACC, and again, dash M info equals Excel. Uh, the M info does similar sorts of things. It prints a little bit of extra information. ACC is for open ACC. So you see the, the difference here is slight but noticeable. Open MP, you have a, a dash MP option. Open ACC, you have a dash ACC option. Uh, I think we're going to do this in, I know we have build and run it. Um, so we'll go back to hands-on, jump back into your uh, clone of the training repo, and you might need to go back a directory again to find it, but you should see a directory called openmp-openacc. Uh, take a look in there, take a look at the uh, readme, uh, if you like it, the code, um, and build and run it, and take a look at the output. Uh, don't forget we're doing this one in program NVIDIA. And we'll do the same thing. So uh, raise a hand and lower it when you're done. And when we have uh, only a few hands left raised, we'll move on to the next step. So the last couple of topics is about uh, a few extra tips around uh, building code. Uh, one that is very easy to uh, trip up on, it's, it's powerful, but uh, also a little bit particular is uh, using CMake. For the most part, it should just work. Uh, we have some CMake modules available on Perlmutter. We have a, a fairly recent version, so like 3.22. Um, there are currently a few issues that we've uh, discovered when linking math libraries in the CUDA stack, particularly you know, things like CUDA FFT, CUDA uh, CU FFT, CU Blast, CU Solver, is that these libraries are in a different location to the NVCC compiler itself, and CMake often trips up trying to find them. Uh, we have a, a tip on this in our docs, uh, but Basically, what the tip is, is to add the mathlibs path to your CMake prefix path with uh, something like this command. So the, uh, this uh, OptinVidia HPC SDK, you'll see that if you do module show CUDA toolkit, it will show the, the specific path. It may be different from one CUDA toolkit to the next, particularly if you're changing uh, CUDA versions. So if you insert this one, the important part here is this mathlibs component to it. There was a question earlier I saw in the GDoc um, about pre, uh, whether, whether we should prefer CMake or autoconf. So we don't particularly um, you know, not support one over the other. Um, uh, in a lot of the cases, you won't really have a choice if you're using code that somebody else wrote, you know, uh, building a third-party library, for instance, chances are it either uses CMake or autoconf to, you know, to, to set up its make files. And so you'll just need to use what's there. If you're developing new code, probably CMake is the way to go, but particularly um, modern CMake. So CMake has changed quite a lot over the years. It's uh, uh, it's gotten better basically. And the newer practices are uh, generally much better to use and more, more maintainable and sustainable than the old ones. I think if you dig back through NERSC's uh, training kind of history, uh, training resources, I think we did actually a little while have a course on using modern CMake and it's uh, yeah, worth uh, taking a look at the slides and the recording of that if you're developing code. 
Finally, this is still uh, in progress, it's not quite there yet, but we are working on uh, setting up a spec uh, 0170 um, module file and configuration. Uh, it's already on Cori. It's actually there on Perlmutter, but we don't have the module file yet. We're still sort of testing it then and refining the configuration, but that should be there real soon now. Um, it's uh, being set up to work also with the E4S deployment. So E4S is, uh, I've forgotten actually what it, what it stands for, but it's <laughs> part of the ECP project. It's a, a scientific software stack. Um, with software stack, something like that, E4S. Yeah, extreme exascale. Yeah, um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of really good um, you know, math libraries and tools and so on that are part of that, um, and it all uh, is also sort of set up using Spec with uh, Spec sort of build recipes and manifests. So uh, we'll have that kind of available on Perlmutter in the not too distant future as well. But the, the spec instance is being set up you know, to work with that. So that will uh, hopefully make uh, installing a lot of third party software easier. So we're not going to go into the details of how to do this for today, but just a heads up that it's coming. I seem to have missed putting a uh, final slide. So just to Recap, we're at the end of our uh, slides and exercises for today. And fortunately, we're a little ahead of time. Um, so yeah, we've gone through building a basic um, MPI and GPU, uh, sorry, uh, MPI and CUDA application, and then explored a few kind of uh, variations on the themes, uh, OpenMP, OpenACC, uh, what to do if you're using CUDA aware MPI and the fact that it's uh, worth using a few pointers towards math libraries, uh, some tricks and trips and uh, uh, errors that might uh, trip you up and how to recognize them and what to do about them. And uh, very importantly, there is the repo that you have cloned that will hopefully provide some examples that you can use as sort of a, a starting point as uh, you, know, you move on to building your own code on Perlmutter. And you know, when you do hit errors that these examples hopefully will help to uh, yeah, narrow down the, the steps that might be missing. So that's uh, all that we have for today. I'd like to thank the about the things that uh, you know, are, are provided on Perlmutter from Cray and also uh, Helen and Ronnie and Roel and Moaz and um, many other nurse staff who have um, been answering questions in the chat and did a lot in developing yeah, these slides and these exercises. So, uh, and uh, of course, finally, everybody who has um, come along, joined the training and you know, participated and hopefully found it uh, beneficial and be able to make good use of it um, using Palmata coming up. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.